Hello guys, uh, let me begin this session by introducing myself. My name is Dr. Vinish Srivastav. I'm a senior consultant in anesthesia and critical care. Presently, I'm working with the Rainbow Group of Hospitals. There's a hospital called Rosewalk. I'm a senior consultant over there. Before this, I was with the Fortis Group of Hospitals. I was senior consultant there for the last eight years before this. Prior to that, I was at Maulana Azad Medical College. I was a specialist over there. And I was also, I've also done my senior residency from Maulana Azad Medical College. Prior to that, I was at Deen Del Upadhyay Government Hospital, New Delhi. I've done my DNB secondary from there. Before that, I was at Grant Medical College, Mumbai, JJ Hospital. I've done my DA and FCPS from Grant Medical College, Mumbai. Before that, I was at Cyan Hospital, Lokmani Tilak Medical College and General Hospital, Mumbai. I've done my respiratory medicine from there. Before that, I've done my hospital administration and before that MBBS. Okay. Apart from my clinical work, which I've been doing, I've also been teaching for the last eight eight years, I would say ten years, eight to ten years, students preparing for postgraduate medical entrance exams and foreign medical graduate entrance exams. All right. So I've also also always been interested in trying to just share whatever knowledge I have. Not that I know everything, but whatever knowledge I can share from my point of view. Apart from that, and the clinical duties, uh, I also play the guitar. It's a hobby that I have, and I like to play wherever possible. Okay, and I feel all of us should have a hobby, especially in these times, very stressful. We are seeing what is happening all around us, and based on the same thing, I hope that you've gone through a session that we've had at An Academy, where it was taken by Dr. Preeti and Dr. Siraj. The links I've provided below. Okay, so you can just go through the session. It was a guidance and mentorship series for, for students. All right, and uh, it's available on the YouTube platform. So kindly, you know, always uh, have. Has subscribed to us and you will get all the notifications and everything you'll get to know as soon as they are uploaded all right guys uh, before i go forward this is one thing i'd like i'd like to show you guys i mean the whole point about teaching is because this is what makes me feel good and i always make it a point to point it out from all the students who have sent it to me so it's because i would like to just share the concepts which are there all right so the, when you get a message like this it what makes the day for us okay so this is what makes it worth teaching and putting all the effort for it. So thank you guys. And I hope that, you know, we stay connected and you guys can, you know, send me more messages like that, which makes me also feel good. So thank you. Okay, guys. Now, uh, going forward and continuing the same discussion where we have five MCQs in 15 minutes. The first one that we start with, you know, so this is a continuation of the same series. So which one of the following should be avoided in a patient of asthma? Anyway, seasonal variations are there right now. So a lot of questions keep on coming about asthma, histamine, you know, it's whether it's from anesthesia, whether it's from medicine, all right, or pediatrics, they will be asked. So, A, options given to us, A, morphine, B, etomidate, C, fentanyl, and D, propofol. So, morphine, etomidate, fentanyl, propofol. Correct answer here is A, morphine. This should be avoided in a patient of asthma. Why? Because morphine causes histamine release. More important, why is this question important? Remember, opioids will always have a question in the exam. Opioids is going to have one question definitely. And remember, even one question is important. All right, you can't take anything lightly. So, morphine causes histamine release. Hence, it is avoided in a patient of asthma COPD. The point is, even fentanyl is a, uh, is a opioid derived from morphine. However, fentanyl has no histamine release. And that is why fentanyl becomes safe to use in all the patients. And that's why nowadays fentanyl has become the most common used opioid during the surgery or after the surgery or for pain relief when we are using IV, IV medicines to take care of pain. Fentanyl has become the most common drug for that. Okay, because the amount of problems of, with fentanyl is less plus it is short acting. Etomidate is a good good drug and propofol. Anyways, they are, they are not non-opioids and both of them do not have any histamine release associated with them. They don't have. Okay, so it's the correct answer here is morphine and the reason is morphine causes histamine release hence it is avoided in patients of asthma and copd all right apart from that etomidate fentanyl and propofol can be used in all of them okay so we finish off with the first first question that we've had let's go to the second part so the question is the shortest acting local anesthetic out of the following. Now, it's a very important question. This comes from all the branches where they keep on asking the fastest acting, shortest acting, slowest acting, most potent, least potent. Definitely questions will come from this part. Okay. And not just about local anesthesia from any, any, any drug which is there. Options given to us, bupivacaine, lignocaine, these drugs we know, chloroprocaine and benzocaine. So the point is, the correct answer here is C, chloroprocaine. 
okay how did we get that answer why not bupivacaine why not lignocaine why not benzocaine why is this shortest acting now for this you have to know the classification so this is the question which has been asked on classification of drugs so local anesthesia drugs are classified in three types based on potency and duration of action this also means toxicity by the way these drugs which are less in potency less potent drugs short duration are also less toxic drugs all right these moderate potency and intermediate duration they are intermediate in toxicity however the highly potent and the long duration drugs these are highly toxic drugs means they have lot of complications also so this is a general classification that we have of the local anesthesia drugs now you see drugs like lignocaine mepivacaine prilocaine they are all considered as intermediate acting intermediate duration intermediate potency intermediate toxicity and that is why lignocaine becomes the most common used local anesthetic again an mcq question huh? guys noted down lignocaine all of you know also in fact when you take sutures you know it lignocaine is the most common used local anesthetic all right it's it's got intermediate duration of action intermediate potency and intermediate toxicity also all right and that is why you find we don't use bupivacaine so often because bupivacaine becomes very toxic drug having more complications all right also it is long duration of action so bupivacaine ropivacaine all these drugs become long duration of action and highly potent ones compared to the other ones similarly now talking about chloroprocaine so procaine and chloroprocaine come as less potent drugs they have short duration of action they are also less toxic drugs and the shortest among them is chloroprocaine so that was the question asked to us and the answer for that is chloroprocaine so it's not bupivacaine it's not lignocaine it's not benzocaine the correct answer becomes chloroprocaine it is the shortest acting local anesthetic drug okay guys now uh, i hope you are aware of our youtube sessions that we are having so five mcqs in 15 minutes the timings are generally fixed what you the way we are carrying it out five images in 15 minutes we have a case study as well we have pre intern series we have integrated sessions okay so we have subject wise quizzes syndromes and flash cards also so like you i mean it depends on you how much you want to watch and gain knowledge from whatever you know everyone is sharing and putting up things over there okay so i hope that you guys watch it and it's benefit to and useful to all of you okay also i want to uh, let you know we are having a test series right now okay so just need to get enrolled and uh, you can assess your preparation the test series is test is supposed to be on the 27th of june saturday and uh, just check yourself as to how well you are prepared and which subjects need more focus from what you've been doing or how your preparation is going on all right apart from that let me also let you know about the special classes that we have on an academy platform so these are the special classes that we have these are the free ones you know so we have the throwback quiz we have quizzes we have clinical mcqs image based questions all one hour sessions that we are taking these are all free classes so you can just come join and you know have a look at them as to how they are all right these are all continuing they are continuing the times are fixed okay guys let's continue with the next question and the question here is contraindications to spinal anesthesia include all of the following except okay what are the contraindications to spinal anesthesia basically one is raised intracranial pressure hypertension coagulopathy and infection at the back so the point is where will you not give spinal raised intracranial what are the contraindications as in all the contraindication there will most of them are contraindications except one of them okay most of them are contraindications except one of them all right so the correct answer here is hypertension the correct answer here is hypertension okay the correct answer is hypertension okay guys hypertension now correct answer is b hypertension so therefore raised in when you're talking of spinal this question means what were the contraindications so raised intracranial pressure yes it's a contraindication for spinal if someone's intracranial pressure is raised you will not give spinal anesthesia it can cause coning and death of the patient so i will not want to give it in increased intracranial pressure coagulopathy coagulopathy what will it do it will increase the chances of bleeding all right increased chances of bleeding will lead to increased chances of hematoma all right and that can lead to increased chances of paraplegia therefore this again is a contraindication if someone has coagulopathy bleeding disorders we will not do it i mean we will not give it then infection at the back now imagine we have to give spinal all of you know what is spinal anesthesia where we give drug over here okay at the back 
so if someone is having infection at the back where we are supposed to give the drug you know we will introduce the same infection inside and this can lead to more complications in the patient so therefore these three are contraindications to the patients hypertension yes you have to be careful about it yes you have to be careful about it but hypertension ideally is not a contraindication to it you can use less drug if you use a lesser concentration you can mix it with some other thing and you can still give spinal with that okay so therefore hypertension is the answer over here hypertension is you know where you can give spinal if it's not very high not very problematic to the patient slight hypertension is there even if it is on a higher side blood pressure you can still mix with drugs use lower concentration but you can use it raised intracranial pressure coagulopathy infection at the back is a absolute contraindication these are absolute contraindications guys these are absolute contraindications where you should not even attempt spinal absolute contraindications huh? remember this these are absolute contraindications not relative okay so that finishes off with our third question let's go to the fourth one important covid times all of us know pulse oximeter has become so important everyone is now keeping pulse oximeter at home also all right so a question from pulse oximeter is very common keeps on getting asked again and again and let's focus on this question pulse oximeter may detect inaccurately in presence of all except nail polish meth hemoglobinemia skin pigmentation and all of the above so these are four options given to us what is pulse oximeter so pulse oximeter all of you know basically we put it's a probe we put in on the finger once we put a probe you know there's a red light which goes inside the different levels of hemoglobin absorb the light and the difference is shown as spo2 i mean this is one of the guiding things even for treatment of uh, covid if you have, if your saturation is falling down that's what they are saying you know look at the saturation when the saturation is falling down that is when you need to go to the hospital start yourself on those medicines if saturation is fine you are okay all right this is what has been said to monitor okay so it tells you the spo2 now the point is when you putting your finger inside and you have nail polish yes so how will the light go through the nail polish yes it can go i'm not denying it will not go but many a times you know nail polishes are also very very uh, it's a medium by which it will not pass through it okay so therefore nail polish may cause a wrong reading and you might detect it inaccurately yes it might be correct it might be wrong but possible it can be incorrect because of it meth hemoglobinemia definitely the hemoglobin is got altered all right meth hemoglobinemia the hemoglobin has got altered so therefore the light passing through it will show you an altered reading absolutely correct it will detect inaccurately skin pigmentation yes if there is a skin pigmentation again it might hamper with the light rays which are coming from the pulse oximeter all of us know that red light which goes in through that right so it may hamper with them therefore guys the correct answer here is all of the above so pulse oximeter will detect inaccurately in presence of all of the above whether it is a nail polish applied if there is a clinical condition of meth hemoglobinemia or there is skin pigmentation in all the above men mentioned conditions pulse oximeter will detect inaccurately okay it will not be correct okay guys now uh, this is one of the course that is going on right now at the anacademy platform so i am also a part of it and here we are covering all the subjects all right it's a batch course which is running and all the subjects are completed in detail for this is for the neat pg 2021 so you guys you can look at it and uh, see if it benefits you all right so i have provided you the links also for the unacademy telegram link all right and other links are throughout the video i have provided you also i always say subscribe and you know have the bell icon you get the notifications from our platform you know unacademy to you okay guys i am also running a capsule course right now even now so like we are running it monthly where i cover all the option well parts of anesthesia so you can see i have covered the mechanism the anesthesia machine drugs induction drugs muscle relaxants so this is still running on and similarly we'll plan it for the month of june also uh, sorry july also so it is keeps on running off and on uh, always at the platform all right so you can come to that as well coming to the last question here five mcqs in 15 minutes so we are coming to the last mcq during the to rescue cpr of a child okay cpr during the to rescue cpr of a child chest compression to ventilation ratio is what 15 is to 1 15 is to 2 30 is to 1 30 is to 2 okay guys so the question is during a to rescue cpr of a child chest compression to ventilation ratio is what okay what what should it be correct answer here is b 15 is to 2 
okay the correct answer is b 15 is to 2 routinely remember always whenever you're giving chest compression all right whenever you give chest compression everywhere it is considered 30 is to 2 okay 30 is to 2 means 30 chest compression and 2 breaths so 30 chest compression and 2 breaths so this is how it's supposed to be there have to be 30 chest compression and 2 breaths 30 chest compression 2 breaths 30 chest compressions 2 breaths that's how it's supposed to be all right everywhere this happens in adult one rescuer or two rescuer this happens in pediatrics if it is one rescuer however in pediatrics if there are two rescuer this 30 is to 2 becomes changed to 15 is to 2 and that is why this question becomes so commonly asked in exam that is the exception all right pediatric patients with two rescuers becomes an exception for it so therefore 15 is to 2 is the correct answer when you have two people trying to rescue a child the correct answer is 15 is to 2 children need more oxygen so they try to give more breaths more ventilation to a child and hence the correct answer becomes 15 is to 2 so therefore 15 is to 1 is wrong in this case 30 is to 1 is wrong and 30 is to 2 here is wrong because it is two rescuer CPR of child had the question been you are a single person doing CPR of the child the correct answer will be 30 is to 2 had it been two rescuer or single for an adult the answer remains 30 is to 2 it's only two rescuer in a child that the answer becomes 15 is to 2. Okay guys, so again important MCQ, CPR definitely has a question coming up always, always you will get something on CPR and emergency. Okay, so that covers our five questions in 15 minutes, a very short session that we've had on YouTube. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you so much. Okay guys, thank you.